So how is this um, narrative of what happened in the China, Chinese experience uh, being deployed in the African context? Okay. Um, and what I find very, very interesting is that it's now being more aggressively applied post-2008, post-global food crisis. Um, so it's, it's resurgent, okay, even though this had been done before. Okay. So this is a quote from a report uh, published by IFPRI, which is the International Food Policy Research Institute in 2010. Um, and quote, the model of agriculture applied by the People's Republic of China during the last 30 years is an example that the poorest countries in sub-Saharan Africa should follow in their quest for development and growth to eradicate poverty. Okay? Um, so Western institutions, Western think tanks, are using this Chinese example in arguing that Sub-Saharan Africa should be doing what China did, okay? both to increase agricultural production and that this is also the secret to economic growth, that you have to focus on agriculture before you can focus on industry. Okay? Now, the Chinese as well, okay, so it's not just the West that are using the example, but the Chinese as well are using their own example, okay, and encouraging those in sub-Saharan Africa to, to, to follow their model. So this is a quote um, from the governor of the Chinese Development Bank uh, from 2008. Uh, this was in a meeting of African finance ministers in Mauritania. China's Development Bank is anxious to work in the area of agriculture Given the current scenario of food shortage um, and food price hikes, I believe African countries should put agricultural development at the top of their priority. Okay. So this, this is being uh, supported. One of the foremost uh, Africanist scholars in, in, in the Chinese Academy is a guy named Professor Li Anshin, um, who works on agriculture, and he's head of the, the African Studies Unit at Beijing University. So here he's saying Africans desperately need to modernize their agriculture both to ensure their food security and to earn hard currency by supporting it. China needs to deal with its growing food demand and Africa needs, uh, seems to offer the solution. So here there's a, a, an additional nuance, okay? Not only should Africa focus on increasing its agricultural production, but there's a synergy here with Chinese that uh, China needs to find new sources for food given its own plateauing of agricultural production and Africa is a logical place to, 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 to focus one's efforts. So which approaches okay, are being supported by this particular narrative in the African context and which are being undermined? Okay? And in order to do that, I want to give you just a brief kind of historical summary of Chinese aid over the past 50 years in the African context to get us up to the, the, the current moment, okay? Um, so just um, uh, kind of the, the, the general overview, okay? China has been active uh, on the African continent for the past 50 years, basically since African countries got independence uh, many of them did in the 60s, and they've worked in 44 different African countries. Okay. If you look at aid that was given between 1960 and 2006, approximately 20% of the Chinese projects were focused on agriculture. So there's this long-standing interest in agriculture. Okay. And just for comparison, you can compare this to what U.S. Uh, foreign assistance has been focused on. The U.S. has worked in 47 African countries, so not that different than China. Um, but about 5% of our, our projects have been focused on agriculture. Okay, so more a significant proportion of China's projects have been focused on agriculture than the U.S. Okay. So I'm going to kind of quickly go through each decade here. And the main point I want to make is that the way China was giving assistance, okay, evolves and changes over the decades, but it often mirrors what's going on inside China, okay? So if we look at the 1960s, um, China has, first of all, agriculture is very big, 
okay, just like it was in the Chinese context following the famine of 5861. Um, but what's being supported are large state-run agricultural projects, okay? Um, collective farms, very similar to what's going on inside China, okay? The other thing to keep in mind, in the 1960s, there's a diplomatic war going on with Taiwan. Um, and both entities want to be recognized uh, by the UN um, <coughs> as countries. So Taiwan had a huge development effort in Africa in order to curry favor um, to, to you know, hopefully uh, win a potential UN vote. So for example, uh, Taiwanese aid peaks in 1968. Taiwan had over 1,200 agricultural experts in, China, in Africa at the time working in 25 different countries. Okay. And what's interesting about Taiwan is that Taiwan has a different approach than um, the PRC does. Uh, the, the Taiwanese are focusing on small and medium-sized rice and vegetable producers, okay? So not big collectivized efforts, okay? Um, but the Chinese are, are, are seeking to counter this, and very often inside the same country, you're going to have Chinese aid vying with Taiwanese aid. So this is, uh, just to give you a, a a graphic of this, this is um, uh, the Gambia, which is a um, very small country which follows the Gambia River in West Africa. And this is a map of different uh, rice projects supported by the PRC, the Taiwanese, and, and then the World Bank. This is from Judy Carney's work on, on the Gambia. Um, so things begin to change in the 70s because in 1971, the PRC gets the China seat in the UN. So Taiwan effectively loses that diplomatic war and begins uh, pulling out of the African continent. So many of these Taiwanese projects, when the Taiwanese leave, they actually revert to the PRC. And um, I think the Taiwanese approach begins to influence um, the Chinese approach, okay? So they start to move away from the large-scale collective projects, okay? But then also remember that things were beginning to change in China then as well. First, with Nixon's visit and the subsequent big push on the kind of Western model of the Green Revolution. So many of these projects in the 70s and 80s have a heavy kind of first Green Revolution focus to them, okay? Um, but also, as by the late 70s, when China's beginning to rethink its own agricultural strategy and moving to decollectivization, you're also seeing the shift to a focus on smaller farms in the African context and less of a focus on uh, uh, collectivization. And then in the 90s and the 2000s, um, as this free market approach becomes um, more present in the Chinese context, I think you also begin to see more of this in terms of aid. Okay? So there's a lot of concern about how sustainable are these projects in the African context that the Chinese had been supporting. There were attempts to hand over a number of them uh, in the 80s, and after the Chinese pulled out, they, they, they were not sustained by uh, local African governments. Um, and so China, in its, in its um, aid initiatives, begins to experiment, okay? And so there's a lot of um, work with public-private um, partnerships. So the Chinese government may be focusing development initiatives, but increasingly, a lot of the implementers are private Chinese firms. Um, and there's close coordination be going on between um, the, the, the Chinese government and these uh, private sector Chinese actors. Okay. So this brings us up to more the moment I want to focus on, which is the food crisis moving forward. And here I just want to uh, kind of show you how this influenced Chinese aid, and just for comparative purposes, I think kind of mention what the U.S. is doing as well, okay? So um, I'll talk about the food crisis in just a minute, but with increasing global food crisis, increasing volatility of global food markets, um, I think there's this increasing recognition that China not only needs to source 
food from overseas, but it needs to do so in a stable way that is not as uh, open to kind of global market uh, variability, okay? You see this rhetoric, okay, about how Africa is a sparsely populated place. It's underpopulated. I don't necessarily disagree with that. Um, and, and this argument that it's very land rich, okay? So there's a lot of potential in Africa, okay? So, um, and, and key in the kind of focus here are, are these public-private partnerships and the pushing of a green revolution approach, okay? In some instances, China is engaging in long-term leases of African farmland, okay, so-called land grabs, um, which are really about export-oriented food production, okay, food production that is going to come back to, to China, okay? Um, this is mainly going on in southern Africa. Mozambique, Tanzania, Malawi, Angola are sites of these, of these long-term leases, okay? The other kind of pillar of Chinese aid is, is, is about infrastructure developments, particularly in those countries that have mineral resources that the Chinese are very interested in, okay? So concurrent with this, what's going on with USA? Okay, and I think there are some important nuances and differences here and some interesting similarities, okay? Um, USAID, uh, the major kind of bilateral assistance arm of the U.S. government, had a declining interest in agriculture over probably a 20 to 30 year period, okay? So after 2007-2008, uh, all of a sudden we see a resurgence of an interest in agriculture, okay? Um, and, you know, there's this focus on food self-sufficiency again in a way that hadn't really been there since the 1970s. How do we increase food production in the African continent? But very interestingly, it's not, you know, the Chinese, it's how do we increase food production, not just for Africans, but for our own consumption. That's not the U.S. concern. The U.S. concern is really colored by uh, our interest in security and our kind of global anti-terrorism uh, uh, concerns. And there's this, this deep belief that food insecurity leads to social unrest and it can foment, uh, you know, terrorism. So that's, that's, that's part of the kind of U.S. interest in food security, okay? So um, big support for another green revolution in Africa uh, as um, uh, AGRA, a, a nonprofit, is, is very active in this area gets a lot of support from um, the Gates Foundation. And where I work in West Africa, there's a particular focus on rice, okay, and a particular variety known as Nerika rice, which is a cross between Asian and African rice varieties. And I'm, I'm going to come back to, to Nerika rice, okay? So very quickly, I just want to kind of sketch out this uh, important moment, okay? Um, the 2008 global food crisis, okay? Um, so, you know, we went through a period of low food prices in uh, the, the 80s and 90s, but food prices begin to gradually increase from 2000, okay? 2007 to 2008, average food prices increased by about 50%. For some commodities like rice, they increased 100%, okay? So this, you know, is of concern to the Chinese, okay? Um, how are they going to access food at a reasonable price? It's like I said, of concern to the Americans because of security concerns. Food prices <coughs> did go back down after 2008, but they've come back up in 2011, okay? But it's a different set of commodities than we saw in, in 2008. And this is just a longer term view of food prices adjusted for inflation. So you have your nominal food prices, but the real food prices, if you adjust for inflation, you will notice that this is not the highest global food prices have ever been, okay? So if we go back to an earlier period in the 70s and the 60s, they, were, they, they got as high uh, then as, as they are now, okay? But high food prices are a particular problem for the urban poor, okay? This is a big generalization, but typically the urban poor, in, in comparison to their rural counterparts, don't produce as much of their own food. They're more dependent on the market, and a large proportion of their incomes are spent on food. 
Um, so, you know, one of the key indicators for food insecurity in the urban context is the price, the price of food. So, when global food prices went up, this spawned a lot of social unrest around the world, much but not all of it in the global south. Um, and there's a particular concentration uh, in West African coastal cities, um, which by the time this happens are heavily dependent on imported rice, mostly, not exclusively, but mostly from Asian producers. So rice went up 100% in this time. So it leads to so-called food riots. Okay? Um, I am guilty of deploying this term um, food riots, but I have increasingly become uneasy with the notion of a food riot um, because I think it implies that there's spontaneous violence. Okay? That um, you know, we kind of have this image of animals fighting over scraps of food in a period of scarcity, and I don't really think that's an accurate description of what was going on. I think in a lot of these coastal West African cities, Demonstrators are unhappy with their governments. They're trying to draw their government's attention to the vulnerability of the urban poor. They're dissatisfied with a set of government policies which led to this particular moment. And I think that's really different than the kind of food riot image that, that we often have in our, in our country. 